I'm gonna go for it. All right, 69% chance to one hit KO, plus a 50% chance for dynamic punch to miss. Hi everyone, I'm Abel PP, and in this video, I'm going to be doing a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Sacred Gold, which is a ROM hack created by Dreano based on Pokemon Hard Gold. As with this Pokemon Platinum ROM hack, Renegade Platinum, the game allows you to catch all 493 Pokemon up until Generation 4 while introducing updated items, movesets, abilities, etc. The difficulty of each major battle has increased as well, which is unfortunate because in a Nuzlocke, if a Pokemon faints, it meets its demise. Additionally, as this is a hardcore Nuzlocke, I can't use items in battle or overlevel past the next gym leader's highest leveled Pokemon. Let's get on to attempt 1. I go with Totodile, whom I name Ash, as my starter as I'm unsure of which is the best one. Cynthia then rewards me for beating her in the Sinnoh region by gifting me an Eevee whom I name May. After getting the Pokedex, ratting my rival Fart out to the cops, and other admin stuff, I can catch a bunch of encounters but won't go over all of them. The important ones are Reggie the Bidoof, Trinity the Chinchow, Ash the Third, a Charmander who was obtained after I tested my knowledge of Pokemon. Bucky the Dunsparce, and Shauna the Meditite. It's now time for the first major battle as I face Elder Lee in Sprout Tower. Trinity leads against his Bellsprout, which isn't a good matchup, so I switch to Shauna who can take him out with a few confusions, which brings in Hoot Hoot. He puts Trinity to sleep and gets off a few aerial aces before getting paralyzed. I then switch to Ash after realizing that Vorticons do nothing, and he slowly chips him down before Reggie comes in to get the knockout. Chingling is next, so I switch to Shauna, who gets hit with a hard uproar. I switch to Ash the third, who deals decent damage but is brought to the red with a crit uproar. Luckily, this also means that he is in range for Blaze to activate, so Ember takes him and Cherubi out to win me the battle, which was tougher than I'd have expected it to be. Lee asks me which evolution I'd like, and for the early game, Glaceon is the best choice, so I go for it and evolve him at level 13 so that he can learn the move Icy Wind. Up next is the first gym leader, Faulkner. Dodo is up first and is put to sleep with Yawn by Bucky. Reggie switches in to use a couple of defense curls, which also power up his rollouts, which take out Doduo, Swablu, Chatot, and Farfetch'd before missing the Murkrow. I'm okay to lose Reggie here, so risk a crit, but it doesn't pay off as Murkrow gets a crit faint attack to take her out. Sorry bud, but your efforts won't be in vain. I switch to Mei, who takes out the Murkrow and Pidgeotto without risking any crits. A few more encounters, of which the important ones are Brock the Geodude and James the Gyarados. For the Proton fight in Slowpoke Well, his coughing has an insane moveset so I do need to be careful. I lead with Brock against his Voltorb who uses Toxic but a Hell Lumberry cures it and a Magnitude 6 is enough for the kill. Cacnea is handled by Ash the Third, and for coughing, I switch to James on a missed Toxic and then use Bite as he misses again which means a few more bites take him and the Zubat out for an easy win. Time for Bugsy. Bucky leads for some more rollout strats as Bugsy sends out Butterfree, who U-turns into Heracross as Bucky uses Yawn. I use Defense Curl as Heracross just uses Bug Bite, which doesn't do as much, and then falls asleep. Three rollouts take her out as she just uses Rain Dance after waking up. Pinsir and Beedrill fall to rollouts as well, as does Yanma, though Bucky is at 8 HP now and locked into rollout so like Reggie, sacrifices herself after getting 4 vital kills. I send in AJ the Sandshrew who also locks himself into rollout to take out the Butterfree, but will be joining his friends Reggie and Bucky in rollout heaven. Scyther is last and takes him out. I send in Mei who does over 50% with Icy Wind, but Scyther sets up Sword Stance. And then, after a wing attack does a lot but thankfully doesn't crit, Icy Wind misses. So, change of strategy. I switch to Brock on the next wing attack, then to Ash the third on a U-turn. A quick attack almost gets the kill, but thankfully Ash survives and a Dragon Rage gets the knockout for the win. That was way too close for comfort and a single crit from Scyther would have meant a wipe. There's a battle against Fart now, but it's an easy one so I'll skip it. Cynthia indirectly gifts me another great encounter by giving me the odd keystone, which I can use to catch a spirit tomb named Cynthia. I then get a Chimcha called Paul who has an Adam in nature and the ability Iron Fist which make him an incredible offensive Pokemon. You know what else is incredible? The fact that you too can have an Iron Fist Adamant Chimcha. All you have to do is like and subscribe and your next Chimcha will have the perfect nature, ability and even 31 IVs across all stats as a bonus. Trust me. 
And now, it's time to relive my childhood nightmare by facing Whitney. Only this time, she has a team of six, some decent luck, and the benefit of some of my mons being incredibly horny for hers, which will ruin things. She starts with Likitung as I lead with Shauna, who uses two rock smashes to take her out. And then, Milk Tank comes in. I switch to Brock on a body slam, which of course paralyzes her. She does manage to hit a few rock smashes before falling to 6 HP, so I switch to Cynthia on a super potion. I now switch to James to get off an intimidate, but James is paralyzed through a body slam and remains paralyzed as another body slam brings him to about half HP. Milk Tank then uses a track, but somehow James hits a Dragon Rage before being immobilized due to love for the next two turns. So, I switch to Brock for a sacrifice. I then send in Paul, who gets attracted and immobilized too, then hits a Rock Smash to bring Milk Tank into the red, and then falls to a critical hit body slam. I switch to James, who manages to get off a Dragon Rage to get rid of Whitney's ace. Clefable comes in, so I switch to Drew the Roselia on a resisted charge beam. Drew then misses two stun spores and after finally hitting one, is hit with a tract. His damage output is low though, so he can't do much, and so I switch to James and then back to Drew to get rid of a confusion, as Clefable just used Reflect. A critical hit Mega Drain helps, but Drew falls victim to Clefable's love again and gets confused. I switch to Shauna for a sack, but he survives, so I switch back to Drew, who falls to a crit water pulse. Oh well. Shauna takes her out, but there's still like three Pokemon left. Wigglytuff is next, so I let Shauna go after doing decent damage with Psycho Cut. Cynthia comes in, but with the constant use of attracts and wishes, I'm basically shut down and lose the fight. While there was some bad luck there, I should have definitely come up with a better plan to deal with Whitney's Pokemon. Let's hope the next attempts go better. For attempt 2, I reset because I get a minus attack nature on my Cyndaquil, which might cause issues with Bugsy. And during attempt 3, I lose Cyndaquil to Elder Lee along with Geodude as well, so reset. Attempt 4 time and Cyndaquil is called Candle. I'll cover the major stuff during the early game to not waste too much time. I lose my own Hutu to Elder Lee's, defeat Faulkner with one death, a Sandshrew named Mousetrap, and then... Your dishwasher? I've tried four times. Oh no! Okay, just kill it. Just kill. Alright, that's death number three. It's a codfish, it's fine, no one gives a shit about a codfish. Um, whatever man, come on. We should be faster, and even if we're not, we shouldn't die to a rock throw. That sucks. Losing a Pokemon, albeit an awful one, to a freaking Onyx is the greatest shame I've ever experienced as a Nuzlocke. I defeat Bugsy again, but sadly lose Candle to his Scyther. I then get a fantastic encounter. Okay, so we get an encounter here. Please be a- It is a Pineco, let's go! Oh no. Don't explode. It can't explode at level, level 6, right? It has to protect. Dude, this is gonna be amazing. Tackle, protect. It's gonna learn good moves anyway. Anyway, in Goldenrod City, I trigger the Ethan rival fight accidentally and I'm a bit underprepared, which means that Rug the Linoon unfortunately fades to his Arcanine. And we're back to Whitney. This time though, I have a Hariyama called Plush, who can use Fake Out and then Substitute to prevent Lickitung from using a Tract. I then use Bulk Up and, oh, a Tract hits through Substitute, huh. It's okay though, with enough Bulk Ups, I can put Plush in a decent position to sweep. Oh, Lickitung gets a Body Slam crit after Plush is immobilized for 4 turns in a row. Plush then gets paralyzed and remains fully paralyzed, wow. I risk a crit anyway and it pays off as Plush hits through Paralysis and Love to take out Lickitung with Vital Throw. For the Lopunny, I switch to Lamp the Spirit Tomb, which causes Lopunny to crash into herself due to an ineffective jump kick. She can't hit Lamp, so I use Calm Mind as Whitney brings in Wigglytuff. What follows is a long drawn out fight as Lamp struggles through infatuation to set up to plus 6 special attack and special defense as Wigglytuff is stalled out of all her moves and Lamp completely immobilized, watches as his love struggles her way to death. Clefable dodges a few hypnosis, but eventually one lands and a Dream Eater brings Lamb to over three-fourths of his health. Milk Tank is next and has Crappy, 
but thankfully neither of her two body slams get the paralysis and she also falls to a hypnosis and dream eater combo. Which means I've won because neither of Zlopany or Stantler can damage Lamp. They waste time but eventually fall as I've exacted revenge on Whitney with some luck of my own and I manage to do so without any deaths. I do catch a Pineco eventually with a quick ball through headbutting on another route, which is great. I then face my rival in Burn Tower and he's got nerd in this attempt so you know I'm becoming more mature. However, Fish the Gyarados, Pebble the Geodude and Plush make this easy once again. I hatch a Togepi and then... Perfect. Oh look at that! It's a shiny Sableye! We can't catch it. But... That's the first time that's ever happened to me so I thought I'd share it with you all as well. The good luck that comes from defeating a Golden Sableye should help me in the fight against Morty which just so happens to be up next. I lead with Knife the Ninjask against his Duskull to set up Substitute and Sword Stance. And Aerial Ace takes Duskull and Shop it out which is a great start. Unfortunately, it just misses out on knocking Mischievous whose Power Gem takes Knife out but he did his job there. Ornament the Crobat comes in and can eventually take Mischievous out and the Haunter with Bites and Wing Attacks. Lamp can come in, tank a Thunderbolt and a Shadow Ball. Oh, yes, you read that correctly. For some reason, Shadow Ball's damage was calculated on the assumption that it was super effective even though it should have been neutral because Spiritomb is Ghost and Dark type. I assume that's a glitch in the game but I think it's okay for now in terms of how much it affects the run. An Icy Wind and Ice Beam combo from Clay the Glaceon take Gengar out and last is Sableye who wastes time with Torment and eventually falls as well. I'm counting the lamp death here because a crit shadow ball would have killed so I'm punishing myself for not playing around it. Now my PTSD from Renegade Platinum is reignited as um no 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 I'm not going to fight you. Oh thank god. Next up is the battle against Yusin and he has a tough team. However, Honey the Beedrill takes out his Hypno in one shot with Exorcism. Clay can take out Jump Bluff before almost fainting to Rotom after getting a speed drop with Icy Wind, which allows Crown the Nido Queen to take them out with Bites, and Pebble takes out the Electrode for the win. Next up are Chuck and his fighting types. Ornament can lead to one shot his Primeape with Pluck, and another Pluck does great damage on Polyrath, but he puts Ornament to sleep. I switch to Fish as Chuck heals and get off a Dragon Rage before Polyrath hits another Hypnosis, and Fish stays asleep for four turns. She finally wakes up and uses two more Dragon Rages to take Polyrath out. Next up is Hitmonlee who misses a high jump kick as I switch to X the Executor. X can eventually take out Hitmonlee while having the Substitute up, which allows her to take out Hitmonchan as well at the cost of the Substitute along with some Confusions, Sleep Powders and Lead Seed uses. Prelume is next but can't do much so falls to a Confusion as well and last is Hariyama so I switch to Kray on the Togetic who gets Whirlwinded off and Ornament is brought in. Cross Chop is his best move here and doesn't even do much with the crit, so a couple of plucks once Ornament wakes up get me the Deathless win. I also get a picture clicked with my team in the lighthouse, which I think is cute. Jasmine then asks a complete stranger to get some medicine for her Ampharos, which is fair enough. I do so and it cures Amphi, who restores the light in the building, which in turn leads to Jasmine finally doing her job by going to the gym. I then have to go save Baoba the Safari Zone guy and on the way have a bunch of battles against Rocket Runs while teaming up with people from the Gen 4 games including Mira, Buck, Cheryl and Marley. But none of them are difficult or result in casualties. In between, I have a battle with Petrel but use Fish to take out his Raticate and Skunk Tank, Ball the Electro to take out his Weezing and Ornament to take out his Golbat. After the double battle alongside Marley, there's a single battle against Ariana. I use Nokia to set up 3 layers of spikes, then switch between Fish and Nokia as Arbok wastes her Earthquake and Gunshot PP, which Fish and Nokia are immune to respectively. This might seem excessive but is needed to avoid losing Fish to a Gunshot crit. Once that's done, I can use Aqua Tail, which crits anyway to one shot. Well that was a waste of time. Honchkrow takes a lot from Aqua Tail but uses Swagger, so I switch to Ball who is left on 2 HP after a critical hit Brave Bird. Yikes. A Thunderbolt takes her out and Wild Plume comes in, so I switch to Nokia who can easily handle her petal lances and take her out with bug bites. Ariana's last Pokemon is Jinx, but Torch the Ponyta can take her out with Flame Bleed. 
It then takes me a long, long time and a lot of Pokeballs to catch a Tangela, whom I call Pitch. The final double battle of this Team Rocket Baoba saga is with Riley against Archer and a Grunt. I can set up two layers of spikes as Absol falls without doing a single thing to Zangos. Useless. Lucario though takes out the Zangos and does a lot on the Houndoom, but I do have to switch to Torch, now evolved, after using a Protect on the Fire Dog's first Fire Blast. But he uses it on Lucario instead. Nice. A Flame Wheel takes out Scyther as Ursaring takes out Houndoom. Gyarados and Mawile come in for double intimidation, so I switch to Fish who does some damage to Gyarados as Mawile falls to Ursaring's Shadow Claw. I switch to Ball knowing Gyarados will go for a resisted bounce and hoping that Granbull won't attack in Ball's slot. She doesn't, so Ball can take her out with a Thunderbolt but gets paralyzed off the bounce. I switch back to Fish expecting a water move, but Gyarados goes for bounce again, so I switch to Nokia as bounce lands on Ursaring for the third paralysis in a row. This though does activate Ursaring's Guts, who takes out Gyarados with an overkill critical hit slash. At the Safari Zone, I catch an Abo PP regular in Magneton, named Magnet, and this is the third time in as many ROM hack attempts that I get to use one, just like Gyarados. For my money, Magneton and Magnezon are phenomenal encounters that you should definitely consider using in your Nuzlocks. They're great defensively and offensively, just don't let them face an Earthquake. I now face Jasmine, the 6th gym leader. She leads with the Matang as I lead with Matchstick the Charizard, who hasn't been used much since the fight with Bugsy. And well, it's an anticlimactic battle, but Matchstick obliterates Jasmine's team with flamethrowers thanks to a held flame plate and special attack EVs making up for his minor special attack nature. Only Bronzong hangs on, but doesn't do much in return, and I've won the 6th gym badge. I then have some amazing luck, getting a rare Munchlax encounter, the TM for Stealth Rock, an even rarer encounter in Pupitar called Pet, a Curlia called Ken, and a Feebas also called Fish. I'll be honest, at this point, this run is going extremely well. I've only had 7 deaths, have a bunch of amazing Pokemon, and 6 gym badges already. I'm certain that the rest of the run will go pretty much the same, and I'll definitely win this run with no issues at all. Yep, I'm sure that there will be no issues at all. A man then somehow survives a Hyper Beam from Lance's Dragonite. It's time to team with Lance now against Ariana and a Grunt and the Pokemon Champion really lets me down here. I lead with Pebble against their Arbok and Hypno. I switch to Shucky who was obtained in Sea and Wood City who encores Hypno into using Meditate. I then switch back to Pebble as Arbok takes out Dragonair. I can now use Earthquake to take out Arbok as Aerodactyl takes out Hypno with a Crunch. I now switch to Nokia as Magnezon and Wildbloom come in who can set up a layer of spikes but Lance's Aerodactyl goes down and he's… done with his Pokemon? What? How can he only have two Pokemon? I literally saw him use a Dragonite and can also see that he has four Pokemon left. Anyway, what this does mean is that Nokia has to take on the double battler alone. However, Magnezon's Magnet Pull ability means that she can't be switched out. So I decide to go for maximum value and set up another layer of spikes. And despite falling asleep a few times, Nokia is able to do decent damage on the wild plume with bug bites. Knowing the end is near, I click on explosion and Nokia is able to do massive damage on Magnezon and take out wild plume while shattering into a billion small fragments as I watch on completely helpless. Nokia was actually a really good Pokemon who would help set up spikes and was also a possible Elite 4 Pokemon but a sacrifice will not be forgotten. I switch to Ball who can do great damage on Honchkrow, but gets paralyzed in return. I risk taking a Brave Bird crit from a Honchkrow again, and she crits again and Ball falls. The recoil damage takes out Honchkrow, which means it's a 1v1 again, so Ornament can come in and take out Magnezone, and Pebble can take out Mug for the win. I'm happy I've won, but I'm filled with rage at the realization that even if Team Rocket are the bad guys, at least they're honest about it. You know who isn't? The man who just had a dragon attack an unarmed person with a Hyper Beam. The man who decided to not use his remaining four Pokemon to help a 10-year-old save her Pokemon. And the man who laughed as Nokia and Ball met their cruel fate. Lance, the Pokemon champion, is true evil. And my goal now is not to become champion, but to exact revenge on Lance by beating him and, um, 
yeah, become champion. Well, it's time to face Fry's now. But one of his gym leaders seems to be a follower of Lance, as his Glalie is ice and rock type, which means a flame wheel from Torch doesn't even get close to the knockout, and a stab overkill, a 150 base power head smash demolishes Torch. Rest well, buddy. It's time to face Price now, and this battle promises to be difficult. I leave with Shucky against his Obama Snow, who can waste 3 PP of Blizzard while doing little damage in return. I now switch to Magnet, who gets crit by Blizzard. I switch to Fish on a Focus Blast, which misses. I stay in to take the final Blizzard, and then switch to Matstick on the Seed Bomb. I can now use Sunny Day, which does not 1, not 2, not 3, but 4 things. Number 1. It gets rid of Hail. Number 2. It boosts every fire moves power by 50%. Number 3. It allows Solar Beams to be hit in one turn. And lastly, it activates Matchstick's Solar Power ability, thus giving him a 50% special attack boost. Dugong switches in, whom I didn't account for in my plans, because he's a Dugong. Unfortunately, a Solar Beam does not kill at this range, but Matchstick crits, which gets the one shot. Lapras, though, is even bulkier than Dugong. So I switch to plush the Hariyama, rendering all those sunny day strats useless. Hariyama can use Fake Out, dodge a blizzard and then take out Lapras with a Brick Break. Frost Blast is next and a bit scary, but plush dodges another blizzard and uses a rock type strength for great damage. A blizzard then does significantly more damage than I expected as a strength brings Frost Blast down to the red again, after Price had healed. Another blizzard will kill here, so I switch to Magnet who hangs on from a Shadow Ball. I should let them go here, but switch to Fish on a Shadow Ball, which does 37 damage, and Fish is left with 36 HP. I still don't learn to cut my losses and switch to the perfectly healthy Octillery called Nose Pass. A second Shadow Ball almost gets a knockout, but Nose Pass hangs on and takes out Frost Lass with Flamethrower, but falls due to Life Orb damage. I bring in Fish as Price sends Glalie, and a crit Aqua Tail gets the one shot, though the crit wasn't needed due to a Health Choice Band. Last up is Mamoswine. I'm scared of Ice Shard getting the knockout, so I switch to Matstick, but Mamoswine gets a crit for massive damage. At this point, I realize that I need to start sacrificing Pokemon, and let Mamoswine take Matstick out with another Ice Shard, which also crits, though that didn't matter. I'm still not out of the woods though. I need to dodge a few crits and sadly, make a few more sacrifices to make it out of this battle with the run still alive. A Fake Out does some chip damage from Plush on Mamoswine, and then I switch to Fish on an Earthquake, who gets a Vital Intimidate, but that's rendered useless due to Mamoswine's Held White Herb. I now switch to Plush on an Ice Shard, and forget that all priority moves have the same priority in this gen, so because Mamoswine is faster, his Ice Shard goes first, and Plush faints. I switch to Fish, and with the Intimidate, Ice Shard doesn't get the kill unless it crits, so ideally, Price won't go for it. However, I need to rely on a 90% accurate Aqua Tail, otherwise I will definitely wipe. Last time I had to rely on this during a Dreano Nuzlocke, I lost Gyarados to Crash Awake. I have no choice here though, and click on Aqua Tail, and it thankfully connects, taking out Mamoswine and winning me a very tough battle. The death count is now at 13, but I still have a bunch of great encounters to use. Matstick was amazing though helping me win 3 gyms despite his poor nature. During a battle with Ariana, I lose Magnet to her Milotic, who was fast asleep, used Sleep Talk, and got Surf, which then crit. Well, I guess that's on me? I can still win the fight easily without any other deaths, so let's move on. I can obtain Riolu via an Egg, and through some love and care, he evolves into Lucario, who is very important for the next couple of battles. These are two back-to-back -back battles, and first up is Team Rocket Executive Archer, who leads with Zangus as I lead with Lucario. A close combat one-shots as Marchand comes in. I now switch to Gas on an Earthquake, which doesn't do damage due to Gas having the ability Levitate. I switch to Fish on a Payback and get off an Intimidate. Then it's a bunch of more switches to bring Ken in on a Payback, and a Choice Specs boosted Psychic is enough for the one-shot. Next is Drapion, but through some pivoting, I can bring in Pebble on a Crunch. Drapion misses Aqua Tail, which Pebble would have survived if not for a high roll crit, but Earthquake doesn't get the one shot, so I risk another crit and it pays off as Drapion falls. Carados is up next, so I switch to my own, who gets hit with a critical hit waterfall. I use Substitute and Carados springs up for a bounce. I can now use Dragon Dance as Carados misses bounce. 
This means that by the time Substitute is broken, a few Ice Fangs and another Dragon Dance can take out Gyarados. Scizor is next, so I switch to Bath Bomb the Tentacruel on a Bullet Punch, who can take Scizor out with two Surfs. Last is Houndoom, who also falls to Surfs. Thankfully, Lucario didn't take much damage during this fight, which is ideal because he is vital for the next fight against Team Rocket leader Giovanni. Lucario leads against his Persian, who uses Fake Out, which does get the flinch, but also gives Lucario a very important speed boost due to the ability Steadfast. He can now outspeed and use Substitute as Persian fails Hypnosis. I can now set up a couple of sword stances and use Substitute again, then use Close Combat 4 times and dig twice to win the battle. And then, I run into a shiny Swinub as an encounter. Weirdly enough, this isn't even due to shiny claws. Diamond the shiny Swinub was the first Pokemon I ran into. I then also catch a Skarmory, though as always she takes a sweet time before agreeing to be caught. Next up is the final gym battle against Claire, though I have a good team against her, including my lead Clay, who hasn't done much since the first two gyms. Sound familiar? A health choice scarf means that she can one-shot Dragonair, Salamence, Altaria, and Dragonair again before Claire sends in Gyarados, who takes a little over half from Ice Beam and sets up a Dragon Dance, but only a crit outrage would kill, so I go for another Ice Beam and am unpunished as Clay has taken out 5 of Claire's Pokemon in no time. Last is Kingdra, so I switch between Ice the Dewgong and Crayon the Togekiss to PP stall her quite easily and eventually Ice takes her out for an easy 8 gym patch. Before Victory Road, I have to defeat the Kimono Girls, but since I heal after every fight, this is really easy, so I'm gonna skip all of it. I also catch a Love Disk, but due to the absence of an attacking fairy move in this game, she just isn't as useful as she was during my Renegade Platinum run, so she gets to rest. The final rival fight with Nerd is up next. I leave with Clay against his Honchkrow, who can one-shot with Ice Beam. Magmortar is next, so I switch to Bottle the Quagsire, who can one-shot with Earthquake. For Alakazam, Eggs is pretty good, but Nerd switches to Gengar, so I switch to Sleeping Bag, who can take Gengar out. Alakazam is back, but Eggs takes him out. Electivire can be taken out with Bottle and Clay, and last up is for Alligator, so Bottle and Pitch, the tank growth, can take him out with the Deathless win. Well, it's all come down to this. Only the Elite Four and Champ stand in between me and a completed Sacred Gold Hardcore Nuzlocke. Well, at least the Johto side of it. However, as you've noticed, outside of the Price and Whitney fights, this run hasn't been that tough. So, to make the Elite Four difficult, I decide to not use Lucario, Gyarados, Dragonite and other great encounters that I could use to make the Elite Four fights easier. Additionally, I decide to get rid of all EVs that I had trained my team in, except for a few on Ken, which is important but in the end irrelevant. This is risky, sure, but if I can plan properly, I should still be able to win. And well, here's my team. Gas the Gengar, Blade the Skarmory, Pet the Taranta, Diamond the Mamoswine, Ken the Gardevoir, and Sleeping Bag the Snorlax. Up first is Will, the Psychic Type Elite 4 member. I lead with Gas, who with the health choice specs can outspeed and one-shot Jinx, Lunatone, Gardevoir, Slowbro, Solra, and Zatu. Six turns were all that were needed, but it will get tougher. An Alakazam at the end of each Elite Four room means that I can pick whom to face next, and I pick Koga, who specializes in poison types. I lead with Gas against his Venomoth, who is part psychic type in this game, so a Shadow Ball is enough for the one-shot. Next is Toxicroak. Now, here, I assume that Toxicroak is out due to wanting to use a super effective Sucker Punch. So, I switch to Ken, but Toxicroak goes for Poison Jab, which Gas would have double resisted for massive damage. Thankfully, there's no crit, but the 20% poison chance does occur, and Ken falls without having done a single thing. That sucks. Ken was going to take out two Elite Four members, and he's out without doing a single HP of damage. I could and should have switched through Pet, which would have baited a double resisted fighting move on Ken. But alas, I now need to find a way to first defeat Koga before thinking of the rest of the run. I switch to Gas and use Substitute, then a couple of Shadow Balls to take out the Doll Killer, which I should have just done the first time around. Crobat comes in and gets rid of Substitute as Icy Wind does less than half. I switch to Pet and then to Blade as Crobat uses Double Team. I now switch to Sleeping Bag on a Heat Wave 
but instead of just going for a move, I start to switch every turn with the aim of letting Crobat fall to Sandstorm Chip because I'm worried that if I stay in, I'll miss a move due to the double team. Koga then heals, which delays the fainting even more, but eventually, Crobat falls to recoil damage from Bravewood as Bag is back at 150 HP with a slack off. I know, that's pretty stupid in hindsight. Pet wouldn't have fallen to a critical hit Exorcer and I should have just risked the Brave Word crit on Bag at the start if I was going to do it later anyway. Muck is next and almost gets a one shot with Gunk Shot, but falls to Body Slam, and then Bag gets chipped by Sandstorm, which leaves him at 3 HP. After the Poison Jab poisoning, I've gotten very lucky. On Tentacruel, I switch to Diamond and Waterfall does 104 damage. Well, Leftovers brings Diamond back to 103 HP which means that I could risk a low roll from Waterfall, and at this point, I kinda have to unless I want to wipe. I click on Earthquake, Tentacruel uses Waterfall, which does 102 damage. Wow. I'm getting so lucky here. I use Crunch from Pet on Weezing, and he misses a Thunder, which would have gotten the kill unless he crit. A second Crunch gives me the very, very lucky win, which would have been avoided if I had just not been impatient when switching into Ken. Diamond was so clutch there. Don't worry though, my luck will run out at some point. Well, now that I don't have Ken, I choose to face Karen next, but this will be relatively easy. Mighty Anna can't do much to Pet, so when she falls, Pet has a substitute up with plus 6 attack and speed through Dragon Dances. Rock Smash is buffed to 75 base power in this game, so a few of those along with strengths win me the fight. Next up is what should be the toughest battle yet. Due to the absence of Ken, only Gas and Blade don't take super effective damage from fighting moves. Sadly, Bruno is the final Elite 4 member and as is well documented, specializes in fighting Pokemon. He leads with Hitmontop, who is stuck using Sucker Punch and eventually falls to Toxic Damage and a Shadow Ball. Lucario is next and Shadow Ball does around 50% as the substitute falls. However, this does tell me that Lucario is baited into using Psychic on Gas. Shadow Ball might not kill if it low rolls, and I need gas for this and the champion fight, so cannot risk her. I switch to Pet, who baits an Aura Sphere, and switch back to gas and repeat this until Lucario is out of Aura Spheres and is stuck using extreme speed and resisted Dark Pulses. I can now set up to plus 6 attack and speed, and then use Rock Smash to take out Lucario, Hitmonlee, Hariyama, who needed 2 but could only one shot with Focus Punch, and Hitmonchan. And then Machan comes in. I protect once, obviously. Oh, this might change things. I didn't even realize this. At 94% HP, plus 6 Tyranitar with Rock Smash is a 69% chance to one hit KO. I'm gonna go for it. All right. 69% chance to one hit KO plus a 50% chance for Dynamic Punch to miss. Let's go hit crit! <laughs> that was risky, but anything for the content. And now, it's time to face the true face of evil, who puts up the mask of a champion to fool everyone. But for the sake of my Nokia and Ball, I need to destroy this facade. It's time to face the Pokemon champion Lance, and he is, as you'll see, really, really evil. Gyarados leads against my blade and misses an Aqua Tail as I set up Stealth Rock. I switch to Gas, whose held Focus Sash prevents her from falling to Aqua Tail, and a Thunderbolt takes Gyarados out. Aerodactyle is next, so I switch to Blade on a Stone Edge, but Blade baits Aerodactyle out of them, staying healthy with Roost. I now switch to Pet, who can set up to plus 6 attack and speed again. However, Garchomp is next, and Rock Smash won't one shot. For some reason, though, I decide not to let Pet fall here, which is a stupid, stupid decision in hindsight, and I switch to Blade on an Earthquake. Fire Fang is baited here, so I switch to Sleeping Bag, who doesn't take much. A yawn and protect means that Garchomp is asleep. I go for Ice Beam and it misses. And well, that's because of me, actually. Pet's ability Sandstream means there's a sandstorm in the field, which gives Garchomp a stage of evasion due to his ability Sand Veil. And Ice Beam missed due to that. So, I go for a slack off, but Garchomp wakes up after a single turn of sleep to take out Sleeping Bag, who has been pretty much useless throughout the Elite Four. Still, missing Ice Beam there is quite unlucky. It's okay, I can switch to Diamond, who has a Held Choice Band, which means that Ice Shard will get the knockout. 
but it misses and Garchomp lands an incredibly hard earthquake. Okay, I feel like that's my luck from the Koga fight now accounted for. I eventually PP stall Garchomp off his earthquake PP before having pet in and I start going for rock smash, which I really should have just done when I was at plus 6 attack. Garchomp gets a burn now, which means that pet is pretty much useless as I didn't restore Dragon Dance PP before the fight, which is my fault. Well, I switch to Blade, but Lance also switches to Dragonite for some reason. I switch back to Pet, who eventually falls after getting Dragonite at half HP, and that's after Lance used a full restore. This does mean that I can bring in Diamond, who can use Ice Shard for the knockout. Stealth Rock means Charizard is at 50%, but an Ice Shard can't kill here, so I switch to Gas for the Sacrifice and Sandstorm Chip on Charizard. In hindsight, that switch is what sealed my fate. I switch in Diamond to bait Flare Blitz, and then I switch to Skarmory, but Charizard uses Focus Blast instead, which does half damage, and then Charizard uses Flare Blitz, which takes out Skarmory, but doesn't knock out Charizard through recoil damage. At the very least, he's brought in range of Ice Shard killing from here. Now, the only thing between Revenge and Defeat is a Sand Wailed Guard Jump. At least, that would have been the case, if not for what happens next. Oh no. He full restored. That's GG. Well, that full restore means that unless I shard crits, which it doesn't, Charizard can take out Diamond and I lose the battle and the run and I'm heartbroken. I didn't lose that fight to bad luck, although it didn't help. I lost it to overconfidence before the fight, which meant that I didn't prepare as well as I should have and healed all pre-P properly. Also, I should have definitely let Pet fall to Garchomp if it meant getting vital damage via a plus 6 rock smash. But as I mentioned, the sack of gas is what sealed my fate. Instead of doing that, I should have sacrificed Blade first, which would have given me a free switch in for gas without Sandstorm Chip taking her out. This would have let her hit a super effective Thunderbolt for the kill and then Diamond would have just had to land a third attempted ice move on Garchomp, because Lance's last Pokemon was a Dragonite who after Stealth Rock damage would have definitely fallen to a Choice Band Ice Shard. Well, I've learned a bunch of lessons there. Always be patient, always be prepared, and always have a plan B. But the most important lesson of all, which should be your biggest takeaway from this video, is that sometimes, evil just wins. If you've enjoyed until this point, or even if you haven't, I request you to please leave a like and a subscribe and share this video with your friends. Every small gesture helps. If you're confused about the nickname theme, let me know in the comments. I might come back for attempt 5 at some point and please let me know if you'd like to see that. Thanks for watching. See ya.